in alphabetical A, B, alphabetical order. And we come this morning to one that really has to be a favorite of, of one and all, and that is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Lord, open doors of opportunity for me to start traveling and preaching other churches back in 19... 19- 92, I believe it was, and the first time I, I ever preached outside of, of the home church was on the Lamb of God, and it's still the finest topic anyone could proclaim. The Bible says in John 1 and verse 29, The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Our Father, we thank you this morning. That we have before us the Holy Bible, a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, sure and certain truth in a day of uncertainty. And Father, we ask and pray that you'd help us this morning to behold the Lamb, see Him for what He is, see Him for what He's done, and leave rejoicing and trusting in your Lamb. We ask and pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, first of all, It's a wonderful thing to have a Lamb of God. The Lamb of God is necessary to take away the sin of the world. Were there there no sin, there'd be no Lamb. And as long as men object to, and as long as men protest against the idea and the notion that they are sinners, they will never find salvation for their souls. God provided a lamb for sinful man. He was pointed to in prophecy. He was pointed to in type and shadow throughout all the pages of the Old Testament. He is gloriously revealed and proclaimed in all the pages of the New Testament. Turn with me in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11. When you find Hebrews the 11th chapter, then you'll slip back to the very start of your Bible in Genesis chapter number 3. Hebrews chapter 11. In fact, let's go to Genesis 4. Hebrews 11 and Genesis... Now we'll do 3. Hebrews 11, Genesis 3. Reading in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 4. Hebrews 11 and verse number 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which, by his sacrifice, he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So, Abel is declared righteous by God on the basis of a sacrifice that he offered. The offering of that sacrifice was his righteousness. Abel wasn't righteous by his deeds or by his works. He was declared righteous by merit of his sacrifice. He offered that sacrifice by faith. Romans 10 and 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How did it... Now, Cain, listen, we'll read about Cain in a minute. Cain brought a sacrifice. Abel brought a sacrifice. God accepted one. God rejected the other. God approved of one. God disapproved of the other. The Bible says in Genesis chapter number 3, The man has sinned. He has fallen into sin. The woman has sinned. She has fallen into sin. The voice of the Lord God comes walking in the garden in the in the cool of the day, seeking out that fallen man and seeking out that fallen woman. And he's told them in the day, in the day, that they ate of the fruit of that tree of knowledge, good and evil. In that day, they would surely die. They ate that fruit. And that very day, the Lord approaches them. And the Bible says, In Genesis 3 and verse 21, unto Adam also and his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man. And he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. This man disobeys God. This woman disobeys God. Sin enters the world by one's man, one man's disobedience. And the wages of sin is death. And here comes God to enact 
justice. Here comes God to execute judgment. And the man runs and hides. And the woman runs and hides. How do you hide from God? God tracked them down and found them. He confronted about their sin. They made excuse for their sin. They blamed others for their sin. But they couldn't deny that they had sinned. And God, God in the garden that day has an option. He can kill them according to His Word, or according to grace and mercy, He can make a covering for their sin by the sacrifice of an innocent victim, by the shed blood of an innocent victim. And in that garden, God made, not aprons, God made coats of skins to cover them. Now let me tell you something. You don't get a coat of skin from a haircut. You don't get a coat of skin from a shearing. You get a coat of skin if something sheds its blood and gives up its life. And that man is standing before God a sinner and God offers him an option. You may die in your sin or you may receive a covering that I have provided for you through the death of an innocent sacrifice. He says to that woman, you have an option. You may die in your sin or you may receive a covering for your sin by an innocent innocent sacrifice, an innocent victim shedding its blood on your behalf. And that man received that sacrifice offered by God. That woman received that sacrifice offered by God. And though there were serious consequences for their deeds and their actions for the rest of their lives, hallelujah, they had the rest of their lives. They walked out of that garden alive because God had provided a blood sacrifice to cover their sin, to pay for their sin as a substitute for their sin. Now, many people have argued, many people have debated, what was that sacrifice? Well, Hebrews 11 says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Romans chapter 10 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What do you suppose Adam told his son was the acceptable sacrifice. What do you suppose Eve told her son was the acceptable sacrifice? Cain knew what to bring. Abel knew what to bring. One brought the right sacrifice. One brought the wrong sacrifice. One lived and one died. Look at Genesis chapter number 4. Genesis chapter 4, the Bible says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she bare again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of... Sheep, But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Now, both men believe in God. Both men worship God. Both men offer sacrifice to God. Both men bring that sacrifice and present it to the Lord. But one was the sacrifice that God requested and required. The other was the sacrifice of a man who said, It doesn't matter what you bring as long as you bring something. It doesn't matter how you worship as long as you're sincere. I believe one religion is as good as another. And God accepted Abel on the basis of his sacrifice. And God rejected Cain on the basis of his sacrifice. And what we learn from the very first man created by God, and what we learn from the very first man who was born of woman on the face of this earth, we learn that God only accepts the blood sacrifice of an innocent victim. And that innocent victim was not a tiger. It was not an armadillo. It was not a skunk. It was not a giraffe. That innocent sacrifice was a firstling of the flock of Abel's sheep. God accepts the blood of a lamb as a substitute for sin, uh, sinner's death. God will forgive and will pardon on the basis of the shed blood of an innocent lamb. That's Genesis 3, that's Genesis 4. Now, turn ahead in your Bible to Genesis chapter number 22. Genesis 22. Here a man has a son, an only begotten son, whom he dearly loves. And that man and that son are going up on a mountain. God is putting this man to the test. He has told that man, I want you to offer your son Isaac in sacrifice upon the mountain. Now, had Abraham done that, it would have shown great faith in a most unusual and mysterious command of God. 
What, could, would a man go so far as to sacrifice his son unto God? That was the test. That was the trial. The heathen did it. The, the, the people who worship false gods and, 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 and satanic gods, they sacrifice their children all the time. So God said to his, his man Abraham, he said, will you offer your son Isaac? Now listen, had Abraham done that, it would have showed great faith and obedience on his part. It would have showed a great willingness to give up his all to God. But it would not have paid for his sins or for your sins or for my sins or for anybody's sins. All it would have done is shown that, that Abraham was obedient to God. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Abraham's a sinner. Isaac's a sinner. Sarah's a sinner. Ishmael's a sinner. Hagar's a sinner. It wouldn't matter if you offered a sinner to pay for sin. It wouldn't do any good. But anyway, up on that mountain they go. And the Bible says in verse number 3, Abraham rose up early in the morning, sat his ass, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. But Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Now, obviously, Abraham had not told his son what the plans were for that day. Dad, what are we going to do today? Oh, play some baseball? No. What are we going to do today, Dad? Go fishing? No. Dad, what are we going to do today? Ride bikes? No. I think what I'll do today is kill you. Oh, okay, that sounds like fun. No, there's no word been spoken. But as they walk up that mountain, I want to ask you something. That boy knew wood and fire on a day of worship equaled sacrifice to God. And that boy knew that sacrifice to God meant a lamb. It's understood. It is understood uh, hundreds of years, a thousand years, twelve hundred years, twenty-two hundred years. All this time has passed since the Garden of Eden. All this time has passed since Cain and Abel. And yet this boy knew because father told son and then that father told son and then that father told son and mother told daughter and mother told daughter. There is one way of approach to God. There is one way of forgiveness with God. There is one way of pardon and cleansing in the eyes of His holiness and that is the blood of a lamb. And so Isaac said, Father, we're going up on this mountain to worship God, but we can't worship God without a lamb. Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And then the Bible says, in Abraham's response, he gets an F for grammar, but he gets an A for theology. Are you ready? Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now, here's the correct grammatical response. God himself will provide a lamb. The lamb will be provided by God. God will give us a lamb that we might sacrifice so that I won't have to kill you. That's Abraham's sure hope. That's Abraham's longing and belief. He doesn't want to kill his son. If he did kill his son, it wouldn't do any good. It wouldn't take away his sin. And he knows that. And so he says, God himself will provide a lamb. But no, that's not what he said. Because as the Holy Spirit of God took hold of that man's heart and mind and spoke through that man, he spoke a truth that was true not only that day, but carried far into the future where another son would carry another bundle of wood up another mountain and be offered on a mountain in sacrifice. And he said, he said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. There the statement is not that God will provide an offering, but that God will provide Himself. And that God Himself will be the offering that will take away sin. What a far-reaching prophecy. What a beautiful picture. Well, what happened that day upon the Holy Mount? The Bible says in verse number 10, 
Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For I know now, I, I know, I now, for now I know, there we go, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Abraham raises the knife. His boy is laying here upon that wood. And just as he raises that knife, God says, Stop! You passed the test. Now look over there. And he looks, and there's a ram. You know what a ram is? It's a full-grown. Male lamb. That lamb has grown to manhood. And it's, it's just been going along eating. And it walked right in that briar patch. Anybody grow up in the south? How many of you know you can walk into a briar patch, but you can't walk out of a briar patch? Isn't that right? You can reach in there and grab blackberries, but the vine that holds the blackberries have now reached in and grabbed you. And it's a lot easier to get the hand in than get the hand out. So, so that, that ram has wandered into that thicket. And Abraham goes over and he takes that ram and he pulls that ram out. And when he lays that ram upon the altar, wrapped around its head are thorns. He was caught in the thicket by his thorns. And on that mountain, in the stead, instead of Isaac having to die, a full-grown lamb with thorns wrapped around its head dies in the place of that boy, and that man and that boy walk down off that mountain alive because God provided a sacrifice. But that didn't fulfill the promise because he promised that one day God would provide himself a lamb. Well, let's jump ahead in our Bibles to Exodus chapter number 12. Seems to me like a lot of this book must be about the lamb. Exodus chapter number 12. That lamb keeps showing up at key times and significant times. For over 400 years, the children of Israel have been slaves in bondage down in Egypt. It is time for God to set them free. It is time for God to redeem them. And the Bible says in Exodus 12, verse 3, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. Everybody needs a lamb, but there's only a lamb. See that? Every man a lamb. According to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. If the household be too little for the lamb, the lamb. Let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb should be without blemish. Hey, listen, there is a lamb. That lamb is the lamb. What I want to know is, is it your lamb? Everybody's got a lamb. Everybody's lamb is the lamb. But if you made that lamb your lamb, everybody in every house needed that lamb. So your lamb should be without blemish. A male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire, unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. Ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the the morning ye shall burn with fire, and thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, what do we got to do? We got to take that lamb. We got to examine it. Is it without spot and without blemish? Can you declare, I find no fault in this lamb? 
having, cho- having chosen that land without spot and without blemish, will all the congregation say, away with it, crucify it, put it to death. The whole congregation is going to kill that thing. Where are they going to kill it? On the 14th day of the first month at evening time. I, I just, I'm going to ask you to guess. I'm not asking you to be a Bible scholar. I'm going to ask you to guess. Do you know what day and what month And what time of the day the whole congregation of the children of Israel cried, crucify him, crucify him, and hung Jesus on a cross. It was the 14th day of the first month, and at even time he cried, it is finished, and gave up the ghost. And they left nothing of that lamb upon the cross until morning. They took it down that night and laid it in a borrowed tomb. I'm telling you, Exodus 12 is a glorious picture of the children of Israel being redeemed on Passover night. But it looks far into the future to a day when an innocent lamb with no spot and no blemish would be crucified by the house of Israel, would die upon that cross to pay for the sins of the whole world and be laid in a borrowed tomb. And you know what the Lord said? I'm coming through and I'm looking for something. I'm looking for the blood of that lamb. And when I see the blood of that lamb on your doorpost, I'll pass you by and let you live. And if I don't see the blood of that lamb, death is coming for the wages of sin is death. Now, what a fool you'd be to tack your baptismal certificate to the doorpost. What a terrible mistake it would be to tack your church membership to that doorpost. What an awful thing it'd be to hang your rosary beads or your rabbit's foot out there on those doorposts. Nobody wants to see your, your, uh, uh, your fez and your, your uh, sideways sword and your crescent moon on the side of the doorpost. Have to stand there and scratch your head and wonder if you're a mason or a Muslim. Nobody wants to see that stuff. Where's the blood? Where's the blood? When I see the blood... I will pass over you. And it's true to this very day. It was true in the garden in Genesis 3. It was true out there at that altar in Genesis 4. It was true on Mount Moriah in Genesis 22. It was true in Egypt in Exodus chapter number 12. God requires the blood of a lamb. Sincerity won't do. Religion won't do. Hope won't do. Good deeds won't do. It takes the blood of a lamb. Amen, amen. Well, for hundreds and hundreds of years, who knows how many lambs were offered on Jewish altars. But the blood of those lambs could never take away sins. Types, shadows, foreviews, pointing to the future. But none of them was the promised lamb that would finally satisfy the demands of a holy God. Then, Matthew chapter number 2, a strange thing happens. Book of Matthew In fact, I tell you what, let's go to Luke. Let's go to Luke instead of Matthew. Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter 2. And verse number, verse number 1. Luke 2, 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Man, you think your government's bad. (laughs) He's taxing the whole world. This tax was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, out of the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was a house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary as a spoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which should be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now this is a curious thing. That little town of Bethlehem, Out there in that manger, in a manger, Mary gave birth to a baby boy. Now, I I understand there's no room in the inn. But they could have gone to the shipyards and Mary could have given birth in a boathouse. They could have gone down to where the men plied their carpentry trade and Mary could have given birth in a woodshed. They could have gone to the place of the government offices and Mary could have given birth in a government building. But Mary isn't giving birth to a fish. 
Mary isn't giving birth to a tree. Mary isn't giving birth to a governor. Mary is giving birth to something that should be born in a manger. I wonder what that would be. Let's put it this way. Mary had a little lamb. His fleece was white as snow. And the angels that night could have appeared to carpenters. They could have appeared to fishermen. They could have appeared to tax collectors. They could have appeared to to anybody, but they appeared to shepherds. And the angels said to shepherds, unto you is born this day. Now who's born to shepherds? They're out there keeping the field. They're watching that ewe lamb. She's getting close. She's getting close. It's almost time. And when that ewe lamb is about to be delivered, shepherds attend the birth of a baby lamb and rejoice when a lamb is born. And so the God of heaven sent some angels to shepherds and said, you better get down to the barn. There's a lamb being born in Bethlehem. Mary had a little lamb. Hallelujah. Now that's no accident. That's the fulfillment of promises made since the very day man sinned. Praise God. Well, nobody sees much of that lamb for 30 years. And then one day, coming back to John chapter number 1, then one day, John the Baptist out there preaching. And he's not preaching, be a Baptist. He's not preaching, I'm the Savior. He's not preaching, I'm the way. He's saying, get ready, he's coming, get ready, he's coming, get ready, he's almost here. Get ready, get ready, get ready. And as the people are getting ready, one day, old John, he's standing out there in that water baptizing, because that's where you go to baptize. He's not standing there with a cup in his hand. He's standing on the Jordan River. And old, say, do you have to throw those things in there? Yeah, it keeps your your attention. Old John's standing there in the Jordan River preaching, and he he feels the fish, and I hadn't felt like that since... Since before I was born. When he leaped in his mother's womb at the sound of Mary's voice. And he begins to scan that that shoreline and look at, at all those people in that crowd. And suddenly his eyes light upon Jesus. And the Bible says, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. There he is. There he is. Abraham had a temporary covering. His wife had a temporary covering. Abel had a temporary covering. Abraham and Isaac had a temporary covering. The children of Israel had a temporary covering. All those offerings on Jewish altars for hundreds and thousands of years, a temporary covering. But now, here comes God's Lamb. And He's not going to cover the sin of the world. He's going to take it away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How will he do it? Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter number 53. What a book you've got in your hands. Isaiah chapter 53. The Bible says in verse number 1. Isaiah 53, 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. What an odd and sad thing. All that you just read about Jesus Christ... His lack of physical beauty, his lack of earthly riches, his lack of worldly advantage. All of these things are rendered in the past tense, except one. He was, he was, he was, he was, he was, he is despised and rejected of men. After all he's done, they still hate him. After all he's done, they still look down upon him. After all he's done, he's still the one whose name they use as a curse word. What's wrong with this world? Why don't they curse Hitler's name? Why do they curse Jesus' name? He is despised and rejected of men. But look at verse number 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. Praise God. He was bruised for our iniquities, thank the Lord. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Who bore your iniquities? A lamb. Who bore your transgressions? A lamb. Who paid for all your sins? A lamb. Who was striped that you might be healed? A lamb. He, and listen, your sin wasn't paid for by his bleating. Your sin wasn't paid for by the whiteness of his wool. Your sin wasn't paid for by the faithfulness of his following a shepherd. Your sin was paid for when that lamb was slaughtered. When he shed his blood upon that cross. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's lamb, was the acceptable payment for the sins of every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. Hallelujah. The Lamb, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Well, what became of that Lamb? Revelation chapter number 5. He died. He was buried. But three days and three nights later, He rose from the dead. A few short weeks after that, He ascended to the right hand of God the Father sat down at God's right hand, ever living to make intercession for all those that would believe. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 5, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on the back side sealed with seven seals. Verse 3, And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither look thereon. Verse number 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Guess where that lamb is now? He is seated on the throne of glory at the Father's right hand where He lives and rules and reigns and saves and blesses and keeps forever and forever and forever. Hallelujah! There's the Lamb. There He is. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Revelation 5 verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing in every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. You know what the angels do? They praise the Lamb. You know what the cherub do? They praise the Lamb. You know what the seraphim do? They praise the Lamb. You know what the creatures do? They praise the Lamb. You know what everybody in heaven does? They praise the Lamb. They praise the Lamb. I ask you this morning, have you ever beheld the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world? It was a lamb that was slain that Adam and his wife might live in the garden. It was a lamb that was slain that Abel might be declared righteous in the eyes of God. It was a lamb that died instead of Isaac so Isaac could walk out that day alive. It was a lamb that was slain to set the millions of Israelites free from bondage in Egypt. It was a lamb that was born to shepherds in Bethlehem's manger. It was a lamb that was declared to be the savior of sinners by 
John the forerunner. It was a lamb without spot, without blemish. You opened not his mouth and died upon that cross for your sins and for mine. It was a lamb that rose from the dead and ascended to sit on the throne of glory in heaven. And it is that same lamb that will be praised forever and forever and forever by all those whose sins have been forgiven. Now I've got to say this. You are a sinner. Who's going to take away your sins? God has only provided one way for your sins to be taken away. That's His Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll not do it yourself. You can't do it yourself. Religion won't do it for you. Religion can't do it for you. It's only Jesus Christ whose precious blood can wash away your sins. And that's why the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. This morning, would you, sinner not saved, sinner saved, would you behold the Lamb? There's only one. There only needs to be one. Once for all, finally and forever, sin paid for, By Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for making a way of salvation.